Good day. My name is Jakub Muchowski. I work at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. The title of my talk is Anthropocene Contract. What kind of historian reader agreement does environmental history need? In my presentation, I argue that the frame for the environmental history in Anthropocene should be grasped as a contract between the historians and their audience. Graham Wynn, in 2019 Presidential Address to American Society for Environmental History, discussed the challenges facing the modern world and environmental history, and he proposed a historiographic approach that could be a partial response to them. He claims that historians as citizens and as scholars are currently dealing with, enumerating them in the short and at least, global warming, the Anthropocene, tipping points, planetary boundaries, as well as rise, raising nationalist, populist and nativist sentiments, neoliberalism, destroying public institutions and income disparities. In response, historians produce narratives about the fall and the end of the world, which on one hand serve to articulate despair and on the other mobilize to action. In Wynne's opinion, however, the dissemination of such stories causes fear that evokes apathy or motivates the selfish struggle for survival and not to act for the common good. A more accurate solution is to build a narratives of hope which are critical of the state of our world, resist the forces that threaten it and propose alternative visions of a better future. Such narratives for win are the stories of the past and neighbors of social change and particularly the biographies of thinkers and activists who opposed political and economic power and construct better forms of life in the world. In his speech, he goes straight to two detailed biographical stories about the ecologist Pierre Dancereau, who researched the scale of human impact in the biosphere and about the political theorist C.B. McPherson, who studied the influence of economic inequalities on the functioning of liberal democracies. Their activities and ideas in the field of environmental protection and creating a democratic society, according to Wynn, anticipate our contemporary struggles. In his statement, I've noticed two important issues. Wynne strongly emphasizes the social role of environmental history and contributes to the discussion on the forms of historiography that would productively carry out this task by indicating one of such forms, there is biography, and offers examples of its use. The first passages of the speech suggests that Wynne sees political engagement of environmental history as natural. In the biographical stories, however, he underlines that in the recent past, during the career of his two protagonists, the Academy was convinced that scholars should, scholars should focus on methods and facts and not on using their knowledge and skills in the political struggle for a better world. It is in the last few decades that the political commitment of scientists has gained a rank equal to epistemic tasks and has been strongly intertwined with them. Historical approaches that have been linked to social movements outside the academia, such as feminist history and environmental history, seem to contribute to this change. I was surprised that Wynne's, at Wynne's choice of biographies as a type of historical writing that would fulfill environmental history political tasks in Anthropocene era. Wynne does not propose a new inventive form, but an established writing style specific to political rather than environmental historiography. Moreover, within biography itself, there are many new approaches that question the character's coherence and agency, as well as purposeful order of his or her life story, such as anti-biographies, imperial or minority biographies. Wynne, however, uses the traditional form of theological intellectual biography, presenting his protagonists as coherent subjects, which have a strong agency and their whole life is aimed at a goal defined 
retrospectively by a biographer. In addition, this form refers to ancient model of pragmatic historiography subordinated to the literary understood rule of Historia Magistra Vitae, according to which the story of the ideas and deeds of the former great man is to be a model for addressee of how they should manage their own lives. This type of biography enjoys unflagging popularity among many reading groups, but its effectiveness as the environmental history tool in dealing with a planetary crisis is questionable. Wynne's speech raises questions. Which narrative forms does the environmental history need to help society cope with the threats generated by Anthropocene? Does it need new narrative forms for this task, or those we already have are sufficient? To what extent may the environmental history in the Anthropocene be a tissue of life? In this talk, I will answer them by referring to the resources of the contemporary theory of history. I will be critical to Wim's proposal as well as some of the suggestions of the theory of history, and I will propose a new element to the framework of environmental history writing in the form of Anthropocene contract, an agreement between historians and their audience. Historical theorists participating in the debate on the Anthropocene, I mean primarily Dipesh Chakrabarti, Zoltan Simon and Marek Tam, point to the need to make changes in how historians produce stories about the world. At the same time, there are, an, there are impasses in many of their considerations, as they accurately recognize the contradictions in constructing an effective narrative about the dangers of the future. The impasses concern, with, concern the universality, interdisciplinarity and continuity of such narrative. The response of the Anthropocene seems to require producing an universal history, while this way of presenting historical knowledge has been discredited as an instrument of Western imperialism. On the one hand, the universal narrative is justified because the agent in the Anthropocene, as well as the potential victim of the new era, are humans as species. On the other hand, however, the participation of various social and political groups in the exploitation of the, the planet, which has led to the disturbance of the Earth system and continues to destabilize it, is very uneven. So it is difficult to use the homogeneous figure of humanity because it would violate the principle of justice. Indispensable to the historical narrative of the environmental crisis is the transdisciplinary approach combining the practice and knowledge of life sciences, earth system science, social sciences and humanities. However, the earth system science with which the concept of the Anthropocene was constructed as a separate paradigm cannot be integrated with the other disciplines of science. Due to the incommensurable differences, each of them discussing the phenomena they label as the Anthropocene speaks of something else. Therefore, the cooperation of these fields of science encounters problems and is more threatened with errors. In debates, the Anthropocene is described as an unprecedented event, a rupture between previous experience and expectations for the future, and as such cannot be narrated. We can construct a continuous story about how it happened, but we cannot grasp the Anthropocene itself and its consequences, because it is a radically new phenomenon. I assume that the main consequence of such historical sensitivity is the impossibility of closing the story, which therefore does not provide the full meaning of the representation of the past or a lesson from the past for the reader. This way of understanding the historicity of our times is not new, as it has been circulating in the Western societies since the Second World War and already then it has become a challenge for those who try to articulate it in a narrative form. 
As a result of the war experience, the conviction that Western societies were heading in the right direction was fading and modern coherent stories of economic and technological progress and emancipation were increasingly questioned. A sense of instability in the present and confusion dominated, as well as a conviction that no one was unable to predict what the future might hold. Furthermore, treating the Anthropocene as an unprecedented change may have great persuasive value if we show audience that the world is an unprecedented, unprecedented situation. It will be easier to mobilize them and convince them to act quickly. And if we present it as an element of long-term and continuous change, they will believe that it is nothing new and does not require radical de decisions. Coherent narratives familiarize Anthropocene, reconfiguring it into something harmless and usual. Well-argued suggestions of theoreticians, which, however, can only solve some problems, are narratives that are multi-species, that is to say, involving inhuman entities in the story, multi-scale narratives, which combine processes taking place on various timescales, including human and geological one, and discontinuous narratives, which take into account the unprecedented nature of the Anthropocene and avoid the effect of narrative domestication. These insights and recommendations, however, ignore the issue of relationship between such a profiled narrative and its audience including the question of the contract that environmental historiography can establish with its readers when it tries to be helpful to societies that challenge the planetary crisis. In my opinion, this contract requires renegotiation, although not as radical as discussions of this theorist would unlikely suggest. The only comments of theories discussed so far on the relationship between historians and their readers concern attempts to influence the addressee and mobilize her to act using the rhetoric of unprecedented event. Meanwhile, these continuous stories combining different timescales and experimenting with the inclusion of inhuman protagonists may, due to their complexity, multi-threading and lack of closure, create an impression that historical writing is clumsy and inconclusive. This way of recreating the past makes it difficult to create strong, unambiguous stories that could serve as an instrument of political mobilization. I claim, however, that complex, voluminous, inconclusive, ambiguous narratives are accurate practices. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, the coherent persuasive stories with strong thesis enter into didactic logic that, that produce an asymmetric relationship with the reader. I think that building an asymmetric relationship between academia and society is an unsuitable solution because an unequal future is not a better future. Responses to the environmental crisis must be democratic, not lead to the reproduction of inequality. In addition to the above mentioned changes in narratives, historical narratives in the Anthropocene must also conform to the imperative of equality described by Jacques Rancière, which he employed to discuss literary, historical and film narratives. The imperative is based on the assumption that all people are equal, not that they will only become equal through education, emancipation or progress. Thus, Rancière criticizes the pedagogical narratives created by those who know and are mature, conscious and equal for those who will only become equal under the influence of these stories. Secondly, 
strong narratives can be ineffective because the reader makes use of stories about the past beyond author's control, the knowledge about the reception processes generated by the post-structural literary studies tell us that we do not know what the reader will do with the message. Thus, uh, the most cleverly composed persuasive historical narrative, which was supposed to push people to action, will encounter the problem of, of interdetermination of the reading process. It is based on the conditioned personal collective cultural experience and combined process generate meanings, senses, images, which have a vast number of variants. Since strong stories produce a hierarchical relationship, they can also arouse resistance on the part of the other C, who will not want to be in the position of one who does not know, is passive and unaware of, and to whom the author will explain everything. Such narratives may be rejected because they do not offer recognition and cooperation to the reader, but the role of the addressee who passively absorb the proposed knowledge. It therefore seems that history should not follow the expectations of those who seek historiography with strong moral lessons for the present day. Complex and ambiguous historiography produces a more equal relationship between historians and their audience due to the lack of the closure of the story and thus without ascribing it with holistic meaning or moral lesson in this type of writing the task of the reader is to make the narrative coherent and assigned meaning to it it does not specify who can be the addressee of it so it can be anyone and transfer the disposition to close the story and create meaning to the reader. It should be added that, according to Kale Pileinen, historians' standard writing, due to the character of their practices, is unattractive, complicated and ambiguous. This is because historiography is constrained with the genre obligations which impose on them the compulsion of a detailed reconstruction of facts. Pilainen's claim, Pilainen claims that historians digging in the source material and struggle in considering the degree of its credibility, as well as discussion of its various interpretations, generate heterogeneous, incoherent and lengthy writing. Of course, there are historians who move away from their field's commitments in favor of producing compelling narratives with great political and commercial potential. However, they make a profit at the expense of resigning from the detailed reconstruction of the historical facts and representation of their complexity. Unexpectedly, the narrative forms for the Anthropocene area proposed by historical theorists differ only to a certain extent from the well-established schemes of political writing. The reading contract concluded within the framework of historical writing between author and historian and the, between author historian and the audience requires only corrections, not radical changes. The new version of the contract with readers with readers would confirm the principle that has been gaining importance for several decades, which postulates the engagement of historians in responding to social, political and environmental problems of the contemporary world. It would involve participation of human and inhuman protagonists in the historical narrative of equal, on equal terms and assembling threads of radically different temporality from, the sh from a short-term story to a history counted in million years. The old rule that the historian seeks to diligently reconstruct historical facts would be preserved. There would also be an article resulting from this principle about the discontinuity and complexity of historical narratives and the restraint of authors from making their stories more attractive in, by simplifying them and adding meaningful e meaning meanings. Although this would be a new 
clause in the contract, it would nevertheless sanction the existing state of affairs, as we have already mentioned. Historians, driven by obligation to reconstruct facts, produce complex, discontinuous narratives devoid of lessons or morals. The last element of the contract, and at the same time its political framework, would be an equality imperative, which established the relationship between the historian and his reader as equal. Wynne's speech from 2019 partially fulfills the above contract. Wynne's, Wynne postulates, like the contract, the involvement of historians in the environmental crisis and in the search for the visions of a better future. He rightly criticizes the apocalyptic rhetoric of shock and despair, which is often employed by scholars wishing to raise audience awareness and quiet its actions. Wynne's narratives of hope could be justify, justified if they offered discontinuous open-ended stories and invite readers to co-create them. He, however, explains them to the audience, gives instructions how to relate them to our current problems, transforms them into a lesson for the reader. Two coherent, theologically ordered life stories of Densero and MacPherson, with a clear message embedded in them, recreate the pedagogical logic with its hierarchical ordering of the author and the reader. The environmental history meeting the proposed contract cannot offer a lesson in the Anthropocene area from which the audience possibly absorb what it teaches. In these new circumstances, history can remain a teacher of life only insofar as the addressee discussing the stories delivered to her gives them meaning and only and on her, on her, on her own draws lessons from them. Thank you.